Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> um, today's video will be our first in the second half of the uh, quarters material. We'll be switching gears from engineering materials, uh, metals, ceramics, polymers, composites, to electronic materials. We're talking about semiconductors and uh, the processing required to make um, electronic devices. Um, administratively, I got a, a midterm from everyone yesterday. Um, from my perspective, um, you guys did um, did well with the um, administering um, of the exam. I have not graded them yet. Uh, my goal is to uh, complete that uh, tomorrow and have them back to you by the end of the week. Um, I'll also post up a homework set for the first uh, I think four or five chapters of Campbell, which is our new text. Um, and that should be on, on uh, Teams uh, by the end of today. Um, so I will go ahead and switch over and then we talk about um, the topic for today. Um, and these notes are posted. that okay um, let's see some looks kind of funny hold on sorry about this but out there it seems to be misbehaving a little bit Trying to share these notes and it went a little bit weird. Try again. There we go. That's what I was more useful used to. Okay. All right. Sorry for the delay. Let's. Um, okay. So we're switching gears. We're talking about semiconductor devices and. Um, so let's kind of uh, motivate um, this and give us a bit of a roadmap for where we'll be heading in the second half of the quarter here. Um, first of all, I want to address um, the choice of textbook again. Um, so uh, those of you, especially uh, the double E half of the, of the class, are probably wondering why um, I didn't pick a newer, a newer textbook. Um, especially since the field of microelectronic fabrication um, is improving rapidly. And the main point, or, or the main reason, is that I'm not focused on the cutting edge. What I want to communicate is uh, general principles um, behind uh, these different fabrication steps and uh, the physics and chemistry that is going on um, and uh, and also not require you to buy two textbooks right in the hundred dollar range or so um, and so this textbook is um, a bit older used copies are available and it also does a fine job of covering um, the basics of the science and um, that those basics are just uh, continued um, and refined um, uh, as the technology is advancing. Um, and hopefully, right, the topics that we cover here will enable you to um, read if you require um, more current uh, state-of-the-art um, understanding, right? You can take the fundamental physics and chemistry and understand um, how it is applied um, in these more advanced um, uh, methods. Okay, so um, the uh, 
state of microelectronic fabrication um, has been increasing rapidly, as I as I just said, um, and the, the industry is continually driving towards reducing the size of an individual electronic device on on the silicon surface, um, and also along with that, uh, more densely packing those devices into um, into smaller and smaller spaces. Um, and this uh, reduction in size and uh, increase in density uh, and also uh, with the um, associated processing speed um, has been increasing logarithmically. Um, and so you get a doubling, I think Moore's Law, a doubling every 18 months. Um, and that, that is held pretty much for the last 50 years. Um, with some small deviations. So what we're seeing is that, right, the number of components per chip and the minimum feature size of those components um, has been increasing linearly, right, on a logarithmic scale, right? So whereas in the late 60s you were, you were uh, lucky to get a few devices on a chip, right, and then by the 70s we're talking thousands, and in the 80s and 90s we're talking you know, hundreds of thousands and millions, right? Now we're talking about billions of devices um, on a single on a single chip, and <clears throat> the feature size went from microns to hundreds of nanometers to tens of nanometers, right? And the cutting edge now is you know getting into the single digits of nanometers. So um, we're you know, and then talk is is um, you know uh, continuing about you know what is what is the end of this uh, silicon-based technology. You know, um, and and how low can we go, and what is next, right? So, if you've ever heard of quantum computing, right? They're they're sort of reaching the ability, the uh, the end of the ability to to continue this this decrease. And so, the the question is, okay, so what do we do next? Um, and that's you know kind of an open question and and an area of intense research. Um, and the goal of this course, uh, and you know, the goal of these series of lectures, is to cover um, the basic steps um, required to make these devices. And uh, the basic steps uh, don't really change that much, uh, depending upon the size of the device. Um, the main thing that will change when considering the size of the device is um, the photolithography steps and the, um, uh, the way that, that that process is completed. Um, that's just one step in the microfabrication process that we will cover um, uh, later on. Okay, so uh, our, um, our devices are getting smaller as we are more, uh, as we're refining this process, but the basics haven't changed that much. And uh, the basic steps are shown here in this figure that I borrowed from chapter one. Um, and this will roughly uh, show, roughly, you know, um, outline kind of the techniques that we are going to cover in this course, right? The idea is to basically spend the lecture talking about each of the, the main um, steps and processes required to make a, an electronic device. Uh, today we'll be talking about essentially the step one, the starting wafer, right? How do we get a substrate to build these devices on? Um, and then we'll, we'll cover oxidation and uh, deposition, both chemical vapor deposition and physical vapor deposition. Um, then we have, um, that would be uh, deposited in the insulators, um, and then patterning, right? That's the photolithography step that I mentioned a minute ago. Um, and this is the most important step uh, in microelectronic fabrication, and it's where we encode the information on the surface that becomes our devices. And you know dictates how many of them they are there are where they are um, uh, how they're arranged right all of that um, and then we have uh, the sort of chemical vapor deposition is depositing insulators physical vapor deposition is used to deposit metals and this provides the interconnects between all of the devices that we have built um, patterning or photolithography is itself um, composed of of several steps potentially many steps, right? This is a simplified version of, of the process and can have, you know, multiple uh, multiple deposition and patterning steps as we build up our devices. Um, 
with photolithography, uh, it, it, like I said, it um, involves the encoding of information on the surface. Um, and, and so uh, that is done by uh, exposing a photosensitive chemical called photoresist um, to light um, that shines through a mask. So we make a mask that um, has the pattern that we want to reproduce on the surface of the wafer. And after we coat it with photoresist, if we shine light through the mask, right, there are opaque and transparent regions of that mask. And so that light shines through and uh, causes a photochemical reaction in the photoresist that either increases or decreases its solubility in later steps. And so it can either be removed or everything else can be removed, or the, either the exposed or the non-exposed photoresist can be removed. In either case, we are left with the pattern that we wanted to produce on the surface from our mask. Right? And then the photoresist can become um, uh, material that either either uh, that that um, uh, covers various parts of the surface that from later deposition or etching steps, and then the pattern become and then it, then the photoresist can later be removed, and so um, it it makes that permanent that that pattern permanent, right? And so this allows us to define regions of our of our wafer that will say be um, n-type or p-type silicon or will be coated with insulator or or etched away or, or what have you and that is the most critical step because that dictates the um, the shape and size of, of the devices that we make and so uh, here in these diagrams wait we have the basic steps and this is going to form the development of the course uh, of this last half of the course going forward, right? The idea is to walk through in, in more detail each of these um, processing steps so that the entire microfabrication process can be understood in more detail. Okay, so that's a bit of a, of a background, an overview. Like I said uh, a little while ago, the goal of today is to cover the substrate. So we're building these devices on some material, and the question here is, okay, what is it made of? How do we get it? Right? How is it prepared? Um, sort of that laying the ground for uh, for the later for the later steps. Um, and so uh, the vast majority of uh, electronic devices are built on a silicon crystal substrate. Uh, silicon is a good choice because it is um, abundant in the earth. Uh, you know, sand is silica. Um, um, and it also, as we'll see later, uh, is relatively amenable to growing very large, very high quality crystals. Um, and so from an economic standpoint, right, both of those um, are very much in silicon's favor. Um, and so it has come to, to dominate the market, especially the consumer uh, market, um, military um, applications, uh, and some other uh, niche applications do rely on um, other semiconductors, um, but those applications are less price sensitive and require much lower volumes um, than, than the consumer market, right? So like the tablets and the computers and the cell phones, right, that we are communicating on now, right, are all silicon-based um, uh, devices. Okay, so uh, we're going to make use of some of the uh, foundational material that we covered in the first half of the class when we were talking about um, structural materials. Um, so uh, don't throw away right all of your uh, all of what we've learned about phase diagrams and crystal structures because we're going to be reusing that um, in our discussions here. Um, the first of which is here the phase diagram. This is silicon and arsenic. So silicon is the base material, and uh, we're looking at arsenic. This is not really an, an alloy like we would think about with um, uh, structural materials in the sense that you know we're going to make use of the entire uh, crystal structure or uh, the entire phase diagram. Excuse me. Right. In general, we're going to be looking at this silicon region uh, at the far left. 
So um, we do add arsenic to silicon, but not to create an alloy, right? What we are generally tailoring in microfabrication of electronic materials is the conductivity of silicon, right? Silicon will not be a load-bearing device or load-bearing um, uh, material. Um, and so, you know, the considerations that we can that we talked about in the first half of the class, that being like solid solution strengthening or dislocation, motion, um, impeding, all of those things, those are changing the strength and conductivity properties, and those are structural materials here. These are not structural materials, these are functional materials, and so we're adding arsenic not to change its strength or ductility, but to change its conductivity. Um, and um, many of you were in Material 560 where we went into more depth about how arsenic um, and uh, phosphorus and boron and other elements that are adjacent to silicon on the periodic table can be used to change the conductivity. Um, and uh, uh, if you need a review on that, um, maybe I can make a supplementary video uh, talking about um, as a refresher for the electronic properties of semiconductors. Uh, just let me know. Um, just you know, post a, a comment um, in Teams, and I'll be happy to do that. Okay, but we see here that um, the solubility of arsenic in silicon increases as a function of temperature. We saw this often with um, the structure materials as well, uh, and it was made. We made use of this in our solid solution strengthening, where you can create a higher concentration at a higher temperature, and then if you cool it rapidly, you will quench the material and those dissolved um, atoms will be stuck, right? And they would normally come out of solution, but they don't have enough time and temperature to diffuse um, and to create these particulates. Uh, you can do the same thing with semiconductors, which allows you to create uh, a silicon material with a higher percent of dopants than you would normally have um, if you introduce them at uh, a lower temperature. We've already talked about unit cells, so we're going to have uh, we can still we can recycle our our knowledge of crystal um, unit cells, uh, especially the cubic systems. Uh, Miller indices will be used as we talk about different crystal planes within the silicon crystal, and um, in particular, we talked about you know, several crystal structures prior to this, but uh, the one we want to remember uh, most is the diamond structure because this is the one that group four. Uh, atoms adopt that would be carbon, silicon, germanium, um, and that is shown here. Right, this is the uh, the diamond structure um, where you can think of it as uh, in a couple of different ways. Um, you, the, I think the easiest is to think about it as two face-centered cubic crystals that have been offset by one quarter of the body diagonal, right? Um, which means that at every corner you have a tetragonal uh, um, unit, right? And that's what's shown here in black, where you would have this face-centered atom, this face-centered atom, and this face-centered atom, right, around the corner, and then you would have the corner atom, and then you would have the center atom between those four positions that would be offset one one quarter of a body diagonal, right? So these are all atoms within the um, the unit cell, and um, it satisfies the, va the the valency of the group four atoms, meaning they have a a purely covalent bond, and they have four valence electrons to contribute, and they need four, and so they are have four covalent bonds that are equal uh, with its neighbors, and that's what you get with a group four silicon, or a you know, group four element like silicon, or like carbon, or like germanium. Um, if you were to, um, instead of having a group four, you have a three five material, that would be an equal number of a group three material, meaning one less electron, 
and an equal number of group five uh, material, maybe one extra electron, um, you will have a similar crystal structure where um, you have the same location of all of the atoms, except you're swapping out half of them. Uh, well, half of them will be the group three, the other half will be the group five, and um, you would have, say, in that case, the center atom here in this black uh, tetragonal uh, unit would be one of the elements, and then the other four would be the other elements, and so each of them uh, are bonded to uh, four of the other uh, other types. So that would be a compound semiconductor, but it adopts the basic same crystal structure, um, just with some of the atoms, uh, half the atoms, group three, and the other half, group five. Okay, so um, so generally, uh, we can look at the phase diagrams, but really what we want is this solubility as a function of temperature. And so it's easier to extract that information and to display it by itself. And here you can in include uh, many different elements. So here, um, the second figure here on this page, I'm trying to zoom in a bit, there we go, shows you the solubility, uh, the concentration that, that you can dissolve as a function of temperature for many different atoms, and these are all in silicon, right? And so you can see they tend to have this uh, this uh, inverted C, like we saw before in some of our time temperature transformation diagrams, um, but that's just reflected of essentially this curve here in the silicon for arsenic, right? And so this curve would have a similar shape um, but maybe would be uh, wider or narrower depending upon the element that you're dissolving in silicon, right? Arsenic in this case is way over here um, at relatively high concentrations. Other elements uh, dissolve at much lower concentrations. But our common dopants are grouped here. We've got boron, arsenic, phosphorus, um, and then so the high solubility gives us a wider range of doping and Conductivities that we can achieve with the silicon. Okay, so um, so we have a crystal structure with silicon, and so since we have a crystal, we have all of the same defects that crystals can have, um, except that silicon materials are made uh, exceptionally carefully, and have far fewer of those defects than than engineering materials, um, as we'll talk about the crystal growth later in this uh, in this video. And so uh, we're going to have the same type, and uh, that, that means we're going to have vacancies. And just like we saw before, right, these vacancies are going to um, uh, be temperature dependent, meaning that we will always have some vacancies, regardless of how perfect our crystal is at, at any given temperature. Um, however, uh, the bonds between the uh, silicon atoms are quite strong, and there are many of them. And so the energy of creating a vacancy is very high. And so, as we saw before, when you have a high activation energy, uh, you either require a lot of temperature or you just don't have very many of those events. And so that's the case here where there are vacancies, but there will be a lot fewer than you would have in, say, um, a, an iron crystal due to that higher activation energy. Uh, the, main the main defect that we are going to talk about in electronic properties or in this microfabrication is substitutional impurities and most of these are intentional right so intentional would be these dopants that we're talking about taking a silicon crystal and intentionally adding okay I thought for a second my computer froze um, maybe it kind of did doesn't want to move around this PDF. And now it's just spilling. Um, at any rate, maybe it will catch up while I finish this page. So we have um, intentional defects that we're adding as dopants, either uh, group three or group five. And um, that would be a one-dimensional defect. We also have uh, two-dimensional, or sorry, 
Vacancies and impurities are zero-dimensional defects. We also have one-dimensional dislocations in our crystal structure. Um, and then we don't, like a two-dimensional, we don't have grain boundaries because you see we grow a single crystal, um, but we do have you know, edges of that material. And so mostly we're talking about, uh, with defects, ones we are going to talk mostly about are the intentional impurities um, and the unintentional, those would be contaminants, those are going to be actively minimized. Um, and our growth method is going to be done carefully to help to, to minimize those um, as much as we can. Um, we can form precipitates, and that would occur if we um, heat up the material enough after we've quenched it, right? So we have created a supersaturated solution due to that increase in solubility limit with temperature. And then if we uh, quench the material and later heat it back up, right, we could have those supersaturated um, elements uh, diffuse and, and form precipitates within the material. And so this is one of the reasons why we, uh, we want to be careful about how much we heat up the material in subsequent steps, and that's why we'll talk about rapid thermal processing um, in a later lesson. Um, but my PDF has frozen. But I'm still recording the video, so what I'm going to try to do is to cancel the sharing just for a moment. Okay, actually my computer is still choking. So I'm just going to stop this video and I'll post a part two picking up where I left off.